Is that all right? I don't want to be that speaker who, you know, like, oh, I don't need a microphone. And then everyone, you know what, we're going to probably use the mic just because, you know, you're, you're, you're blasting your head with all kind of various whatnot in your day-to-day -day job. So you can, even if you have those old ears that are, that are all tired, you can still hear me, okay? So, yeah, this is really fun for me. This is, we get, we get some first responders in some of our uh, line of work in our classes, and we consult with a few agencies and departments around the country. But for the most part, um, my job is to be a trainer and consultant for covert entry, for non-destructive entry. And that's a fun gig. It's fun to do the professional side of things. It's way more fun to do the ops side of things. Uh, we have a whole operations division, and our job is to break into places. If you, like, it's getting a little dated on this reference here, but if you're old enough to remember a movie uh, in the early 90s, 1992, called Sneakers, Robert Redford, City Poitier, Lake River Phoenix, uh, that's what we do. We get hired by firms to break into places we don't belong, and then we document how it works and let people harden their security. And this is a fun flip of the script for me, because here I get to talk really in the interests of showing you all the weakest security, and your day is a good day when the security is weak enough that you can, you can get in without a lot of fanfare. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really neat work. I'm a big fan of it. I'm very lucky to be able to do it, and I'm very lucky to be able to be here with you. And between the police training, between the firefighters, getting word out to the right folk really makes me happy. So, when you're making an entry, right, getting into a place that you need to get into, who's done something like this before? Exactly, either in training or proper, like, you get out the irons, you get out the halligan. This is, you know, I I'm sure that your job is also fun. Because, again, who gets to legally destroy things? That's fantastic. And from an outsider's perspective, I think that's beautiful. But I recognize that there is a time and a place where overt destructive entry may not be as advantageous. Can anyone tell me what's happening here? This gentleman, you can see, he's, he's demonstrating a key that, that doesn't work. He's like, this key can't turn, but he's going to take a quick whack at it. What's that called? Bumping. Bumping, absolutely. So this would be an example of non-destructive entry. So you can obviously get the door open. Some people might say it's not as fun, but you're not gonna break anything down. Why do I like to talk about this in a crowd like this? Why do a lot of first responders get to use this knowledge? Well, simply put, it is less paperwork. You can get chewed out and you can be facing a lot of questions you don't want if you break out the irons when it's, oh, well, was it a priority call? Was it not a priority call? Are we allowed to do that or are we not? I don't know if there's anybody who's paramedic or EMT in this room. We have a lot of times where people will say they can respond to a situation and the door's locked and they can't get someone back on the phone, but they're like, are we, gonna do, are we allowed to do this? No, my boss says call the fire department. I don't want someone chewing my ass out. So giving people an option to go less destructive and you're not gonna pay the price that you would if you crack the door open, that's a good day as well. This is not going to be a lock picking talk. Uh, many of you were talking with me as I came in, we are BSing, and of course Zach said that he saw some of my content. If you see me online, I'm known mostly as a lock picker. And I've done a lot of lectures about how locks work, what the parts are on the inside, this is a pin tumbler lock, this is what the key does, this is why the pins do or don't turn. We can talk about that another time. There's plenty of content online if you want to learn, if you've never done lock picking at all. Like, the These are all my animations that show up kind of like retweeted and stuff, and they show up on Reddit. And I'm proud of them. I'm, I'm proud to talk about how you can use pick tools to manipulate the lock open. That's not exactly a tactic that people are likely to turn to if they're in the midst of a high stress situation, uh, if you've got PPE on, if you've got gloves on, you're probably not doing a tiny finesse attack inside the lock, trying to feel how the pin, I can oh, I feel a click, all right, one pin down, four to go. Again, has anyone ever done any kind of lock picking? There's some hands in the room, but you gotta get some more, some more pick tools in people's hands. This is, this is a not a lot of hands crowd. But that's another day, that's a topic for another day. And if you wanna learn about this, again, there's plenty of resources online. That's not what we're talking about tonight, though. What I wanna focus on is quick, easy, exigent entry through mostly what we will call bypassing. A lot of the tactics you're gonna, talk, you're gonna see talked about tonight are what we in the, in the covert entry field will refer to as bypassing. Because instead of reaching into the lock, like, this is not mechanically complex, setting pins, get the lock to turn. The pins aren't what's holding the door shut. You know, a bolt or a latch is holding the door shut, a big hunk of metal. And if you can just bypass the lock and go right to that bolt work and slip it in one second, well, that's a much better day, and it's much easier to do, usually. 
some bypasses. Let's start with the dumbest one first. And I love demoing this on, on jobs. People say, no, you can, what? You're nowhere near the lock. You're on the other side of the door. Yeah. Bashing hinge pins out of the door, don't dismiss it as a, as a valid entry. I've used this on professional penetration gigs in server rooms. If you can knock hinge pins out, the locks are all on this side of the door, the access control, the system, you name it. Walking the whole door away from the wall, totally valid. And I, I mean, a, everyone under here understands this. You all see, like, what has he shown us this far? I will show you the cool thing that I like to talk about, though, is this little guy. Has anyone seen a little hammerless hinge tool, a little hammerless punch? The idea is it's two pieces of steel connected with a little spring rod. You can stretch and snap, and you don't have to lug around another giant piece of something with you. So, hinge attacks, everyone, you know, like you can carry around a lot of stuff, but I want to minimize the amount of weight on you. And not having to run back to a tool bag, not having to run, oh, who has the thing, who has the knot? This little thing that's the size of a pen gets me in a bunch of doors. And when people aren't familiar with fire code, like corporate clients, they, they are, I show them this kind of deck, and they're like, no, I mean, we have a proper secure building. We would never put the hinge, who what kind of an asshole puts the hinges on the outside? Oh, wait a minute, these hinges are clearly on the outside. Well, yeah, if you have more than 50 people in a room, we are in an area of assembly, which means the doors have to open outward, and they have to open with panic egress hardware, less than five pounds of pressure. Like, the fire code makes, the, makes getting in really easy. It's not just about getting out, it makes getting in easy because of the way the doors are designed. Speaking of the door, the latch, the latch actually holding the door shut. I said there's you know, very limited poundage of pressure, a very limited amount of force that has to actuate the door. Another very small tool that I love. This is called a traveler hook. There's a lot of different tools that fit this category, like latch slipping tools. That's my favorite one. This photo, by the way, is an old photo. This is long ago when I met a buddy of mine named Keith. Uh, Keith, who's another lock picker like me, he was at a HackerCon event that we were running. And I was like, Keith, I'm really excited to meet you. I knew him online, but I never met him in person until that day. I said, man, I was really excited to meet you, man. Like, you were an actual trading locksmith in the field for years. I mean, I'm just a guy who does this for fun at the time. I said, I'd love to, man, if I could have seen your daily carry kit, like that would be something. He's like, oh, I still got that. And he unzips a little pouch and dumps a bunch of stuff out. And it was like screwdrivers and stuff like this. And I was like, oh, wow, that's anticlimactic. Uh, I guess, well, you're servicing things in the, I would meant like an entry kit. Like I thought you had locks, picks and stuff. He's like, no, I got picks too, but these are my entry tools. Like, what do you, the key is a freaking screw. What is this thing in the middle? He, I don't know, I found it at a flea market. I said, what? Are you talking like, la like latch slipping? That works? He's like, oh yeah. Like 80% of my jobs, I would get customers in. I'd never uh, like pick the lock. I'm like, so you're telling me, yeah. Here we have a lock door. Reach in with a traveler hook, and I'm just gonna grab that latch. This is a classic latch slipping attack, right? This is sometimes called loiding, because in ye olden times, before we had a lot of modern polymers and the like, you can do the same kind of thing by shoving polymer in, right? Well, we didn't have plastics and polymers. What did we have? We had celluloid. So you'd use celluloid film to jam into the door. So loiding is something locksmiths have done for ages, and it still works to this day. Here we have a locked door, traveler hook, and you get a better view from the other side in a minute here. So yeah, reach in, you can see this lock is clearly locked. I'm not hitting the handle. Now there are some things going wrong in this door. We'll talk about that. But traveler hook, pull it over, bam, door's open. No destruction, no bending, no breaking. The thing that's going wrong in a lot of this footage, because these are modern, modern doors shouldn't be that easy to get open. Modern doors many times, especially exterior doors, are equipped with what are known as dead latches. This is an example, this diagram is a dead latch. Highlighted in yellow. That is just the latch. That is, I mean, people may remember, that's what doors only had that growing up. Like that's what, oh, there's the latch, okay, it closes. And interior doors might look like this to this day. That little plug, that might be called a passage mode latch. But modern hardware, instead of just a single latch, you'll have an extra element. Something else is going on here. You see that extra plunger, sometimes called a guard bolt? That is the sign of a dead latch. And many people have seen those too. I mean, again, like you walk through a door all the time. You know, look, there's this. Oh, I've, I've seen that before. What you might not realize, because most of the time you're interacting with this as you're walking past it when the door is open. When a door is shut with a dead latch, 
That little plunger is not supposed to be out. It's supposed to be held back by the strike plate. That is what makes the latch dead. When the guard bolt, when the extra security plunger is held back, that latch is now not able to be hooked, slipped, pushed, prodded, poked, loited. That's what makes a dead latch. The problem is door fitment. So many doors do not have the proper door fitment to engage the little dead latch plunger, the guard bolt mechanism. So we're paying for modern hardware on our doors, but they're operating effectively like doors back in the 20s. So this is a modern system. This is a server room, right? This is a very high-tech attack piece of plastic, right? Shoving it in there, just chunk. Look at the size of the strike plate hole, right? Is that the original strike plate that came with this, this door hardware? No. Why does it look so weird? Yes, this is an electronically controlled door. That's an electrified solenoid strike plate. And I literally know integrators and installers we've met, and they're like, oh yeah, we always love to order the, the JPX-19. It's got that giant hole. It always works no matter what door the customer has. No, man, no. That is not the way to install these. You need to have that guard bolt recessed and held back. And if it's not, all it, all it takes is a person with a piece of plastic or a traveler hook or, or you know, like we're going to talk about other latch slipping tools to come along, reach in and flick that latch out of the way. A lot of our work that we do doing assessments, this is critical infrastructure. These are water pumping stations that you've seen in a lot of this footage, right? So I'm there with the supervisor and I'm showing her, I'm like, so your facility has really nice, strong steel doors, but like $5 hook. Like, I don't belong in there. You don't want me in there at all. I'm going to hurt myself. Uh, sometimes you'll see protective plates, right? People will say, okay, we're going to make sure that you can't reach the latch. That's very easy to get around. Piano wire or long reaching tools. It's not that whether you can or can't reach the latch that's the issue. The latch is not installed correctly. So just because you approach a door and you're like, oh man, they got a big old plate over that thing. That doesn't necessarily mean you can't just slip it. It might make it harder to reach the latch, but it doesn't mean that they actually fit the door correctly. You might have a very slippable latch, even if it looks guarded, right? Uh, one of my favorite tools, not just because it is made in Seattle, where I currently live. Has anyone ever seen the Sea Rat? A couple of hands, all right. Uh, I really like this. I don't make any money off this company. They're just one that I picked up online. We'll pass it around. It is designed to be a latch slipping tool in all guises that you can come across. Uh, it is, some people, I even saw on your table, you, you carve down a T-square and the, uh, the little mini knife is sticking off to the side. That's something you can use to shove and hook other types of uh, bolts. But yeah, the C-Rat, really well made, made to be used with gloves, made to be used when you, you know, really have a big situation, you can't kind of get your PPE off. This is just, this is a video that they filmed with all different doors around Seattle and elsewhere. Kava Simplex, Series 1000, a couple of exploits for that we'll talk about. But you don't need them, the C-Rat fits in, bam. Big plates, and look at all the fasteners. Like people really tried like, to guard that latch, right? But no, not at all. So I love this kind of footage. I love, and it really is that easy. I mean, they really, they put a lot of thought into making the tool beefy enough that you can kind of just shove it down with a little bit of a canted plow, and it'll just jam its way through. Has anyone ever done any kind of latch slipping like this with improvised tools or real tools? All right, well, anyone thinking about it now? Yeah. So I love that. I really like the design. Um, it's like a one-man shot. It's one firefighter who makes that in Seattle, and he's hard to get a hold of. Uh, so it took me a while to get my order fulfilled, but I'm happy that I got it. Panic exit devices. We talked about how the, the pounds of pressure needed to push a, an egress device inside of a building, that is rated by, by code. You can't have a super heavy, heavy door for egress reasons. What does that mean? Well, it means if there's an, any gap in the door, thin wire tools should be able to slip right in and pop that open. Let's look at that again. It's just a bent rock. And again, people will treat, you know, weather stripping is not a security device. Weather stripping is great for your environmentals, but that's not, like, this is rubber. Like you can, the door has to have a little bit of gap so that you can reach, you know, the door will close properly, not drag on itself. You can reach through with any number of tools. There are tools that are specifically made for this. I mean, you saw me using Adobe bent rod. This is our partner, Robert. 
He's using an actual, it's called a double door tool, sometimes DET you'll hear referred to. So that's a, a slightly reinforced one. There's one on Zach's table of tools over here, where you get just you know, a couple bit of reinforcements in those square angles. And that's going to give you just enough effort to reach in there and hit that. Uh, exit paddles, they work the same way. Again, low pounds of pressure. You can, look, at the, look at the giant gap we've got. You can see daylight right through there. A quick slap on that, absolutely. In the tech world, when a lot of our clients, when we do covert entry work, a lot of our clients are sort of Silicon Valley firms, big tech firms in the Bay Area. So much so that our buddy, Zach, our, our buddy um, Drew, sorry, I'm looking at Zach over here. Our buddy Drew put these in his kit. Again, he was bending rods. I'm like, Drew, what the hell are these? Oh, I call them the keys to Silicon Valley. I'm like, what? He's like, oh yeah, every tech company, get you in. I'm like, what? Are you like crash bars? He's like, crash bars or like Rockwood pan panic exit devices. Who's seen frameless glass doors if you go to California? California loves flame frameless glass doors, man. And they all have this, this panic device on them. They all have this Rockwood style panic device, which again, low, low amount of travel. There's just a little bit of movement in that rod. And every building that gets stood up, there it's all the same deal. Just reach in, hook, grab. You can make, I mean, this was not a high-end tool. This is just bent rock from Home Depot. Put a little hook on the end of it so you can grab the end of that push bar. Every, like, this will take, uh, no joke, this will take San Francisco apart. <coughs> so yeah, keys to Silicon Valley. Again, small, keep them around. Uh, I love to talk about improvised tools. T-square. What does my wife do with this T-square? Well, let's look at it from the inside. She's going to try to handle it. I mean, yeah, she's literally just reaching around to the crash bar. That's not a custom tool out of some high-end catalog. That is, go to Home Depot, get a T-square, and bend it slightly. And I think, do you even have a cut-down T-square over here? Yeah. Mostly for, you have an edge on it, so it's more of a latch slip tool, but I, I think that's honestly why the C-RAT tool has, it's not like you're desperate for the measuring device on that C-RAT tool. It's like, oh man, is this fire, fire extinguisher the correct number of inches from code? Let's make sure. No, I think that actually is there just to invoke the fact that so many firefighters over the years have been chopping up and bending carpenter squares. So what else do we have here? There is something you may have noticed in the footage we just saw, a couple of the, of the footage we just saw. Uh, the, the first one I showed you, in fact. This is, it's a little hard to tell with the lighting. This is late at night. This was a server, you know, closet room. Like, this is a big uh, server farm room. And it's like three in the morning. There's one light in the, in the vestibule here. But otherwise, this is an unoccupied structure. There's low or no occupancy at night. So what could they have done that would have made my job a little harder? Yeah, I mean, the, clearly the lock, the deadbolt wasn't even locked. If that was there, that would interfere a little bit, right? Well, let's think about deadbolts. Let's think about fire code and deadbolts. Can you have a double keyed, like double sided deadbolt in fire code? Not in America. You see that shit in Europe sometimes. No, you need to have a thumb turn. You need to affect egress. If someone is inside and it's not their building, they still got to be able to get out. That thumb turn is exploitable. That's why this tool exists. It's called a thumb turner or a J tool. It is essentially just a bent tube with usually braided cable, like heavy brake line cable. And that little piece on the end is connected to the handle down in my palm, and you can just go These are in specialized catalogs. Lockmaster sells this one. You have one of the original firefighter J plates. It was created, again, by first responders. Reach in. Doors open. So, yeah, thumb turn flippers, absolutely. Is this, is this news to anybody, or has anybody seen this before? I'm seeing a lot, the, the facial expression is starting to change in this room right now. I'm pretty happy about that. So we're getting our value already here. We're pretty happy we came, even the people in the back. All right. Uh, commercial, commercial doors, as we just saw, in fact, this one particular commercial door is an example of one type of hardware solution that shows up Everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Commercial door fronts love hardware by a brand called Adams Wright. Uh, Adams Wright is a, a brand, sub brand of Asa Abloy. Uh, Asa Abloy owns so many lock brands at this point. But Adams Wright specifically, even if you don't think you've seen it, you have seen this hardware. Uh, they may, it's a dead latch. It's actually a very nice dead latch. The guard bolt 
is way down here. It's a separate uh, plunger entirely. And that actual latch work, there's this sort of uh, polymer bushing in the middle. If you ever see a little latch button, a little latch piece that's steel with a black, usually black piece of polymer in the middle of it, dead giveaway. That's Adam's right. People love this device. And the reason it's so popular, if you like, everybody's on the job and they're like, why do I always see this freaking? Who's the locksmith selling this? Well, the reason it's so popular is because if you notice it in a locksmithing catalog here, what does it not have? It doesn't have a lock, right? This is a lock, this is agnostic, right? You can get any mortise cylinder as long as it has the right tailpiece and install. So it's very popular in various uh, commercial constructions because a locksmith can say whatever solution the customer is using, they can pretty reliably get a mortise cylinder to match. All right, we don't have to change your keys. We can put it as part of your lock system. There's a reason Adam's right has a huge chunk of the market. Let's think about how it works though. If the entirety of the lock, all that really matters is this teeny tail cam, which would swing around, you know, that swings around when the lock is in operation. So clearly that tail cam is interacting with some kind of elements down in here and able to retract and work the whole latch. Well, how, what, what, can that, what can that do for us? How can we exploit that? Notice this lock, as you look at it from the front, any real savvy people in the room who know locks really well, they'll be like, Schlage, I recognize that keyway. That's a Schlage C keyway. And it is, that is in fact a Schlage C keyway. The other thing I recognize about that Schlage C keyway is that I can see it from the back. You're not sticking keys in the back of the lock, right? But that's how locks are made. When, when the plug, is that the part that turns, is, is manufactured, that is broached through with a giant through cut, and the keyway pops out on the back side. That's just part of the manufacturing process. But that means that this keyway is a through hole all the way through the back of the lock, and something that's small enough, you could stick it through the keyway and then move it around on the back side and go hunting around. That is what this is for. Adam's right wires, and it's called push wires. Uh, a couple of companies make them. Peterson was the original designer. Uh, Sparrows then kind of just copied the Peterson design, because Sparrows does that a lot. And then they sell it at a better price, because Ken's prices are too high. Uh, so what is this tool, right? It's just a little rinky dink tiny wire. Well, look carefully at what's going to happen in this footage. It's a little hard to see. I'm going to walk you all through it. I can punch this tool all the way through. So now it's, it's inside. It is inside the lock. It is past the pins. And I can interact with things on the tail side. The dead latch is actually what I am able to disengage by rocking into this. That little piece that's moving, we'll see it better from another angle. But this tiny movement right there, that is the dead latch engaged or not engaged. You're going to see a slightly curved channel right here. That curved channel, as long as I can rock this just slightly, I'm tripping the dead latch mechanism inside, and now I'm no longer dead latched. I could try to reef on that wire really hard, and I think I do in this video to move that bolt. It's not really necessary. Once you get that first hair of movement, the dead latch is no longer a dead latch. You can just get in there, shove in with your plastic, shove in with your, you know, any kind of slip tool. That door is going to pop right open. Not every Adams Wright product is a dead latch, though. Adams Wright makes dead bolts and they hook bolts. They're very popular. Again, like you can see the like, Adams Wright logo on there. You, next time you're going in Wawa or something, look at the doors. Look for that Adams Wright logo. You're going to start spotting it. This is the. Anytime you see that stacked plates of metal kind of design on the bolt itself, Adams Wright. There are tools specifically for the deadbolt and the hook bolt. And in fact, you even have the tinier version than this. The, the one you're about to see is the big one made by Lockmasters, and then Sparrows made a tinier version that you can keep on you. So, we're gonna let Robert talk our way through this. So Robert is reaching in, and you can just about see he wants to hook over this post and swing it through the channel. That is a little post that the tailpiece would be striking. If you turn the key, that little Adam's right tail cam would come around and just swipe that post. You can imagine, however, that with doors, with door fitment, if there's even a hair of space, look how thin this tool is when Robert positions it in place. 
you can get that tool just barely in between the doors, then rock it over and hunt up and fish for that pet you want to yank down on. It's the beauty of a design. So you can imagine the doors could be completely shut, but if you can slip just a hair in there through the weather stripping, rock it over, and there's nothing else really in there to grab onto. If you, if you know the direction to stick it, you're going to hit the right thing to grab onto. Yank. Simple as that. Lot doesn't know what hit it. Let's talk about going under the door. So far we've been all kind of chest height. We've been exit bars, crash bars, latches. Let's drop down a little bit lower. Bottom of the door. Most doors have gaps on the bottom, right? Because you can't have a door that drags along the ground. You might have a little rubber insulator or a sweeper, but you're not going to be dragging against the ground. And because of fire code and ADA compliance, when's the last time you've seen a knob, you know, in a commercial property? You haven't. You have to affect egress, even for individuals with reduced grip function. Uh, what if somebody doesn't have a hand? What if somebody lost their arm in a tragic accident and now they're a you know, Victorian character not in a novel? Like, you need to let that person just smack the handle and get out. That's why we have lever-style door handle sets as the norm everywhere now. That is an incredibly beneficial thing if you want to get in. perspective. Let's see that maybe in a hotel where you can have a good half inch of gap under most doors. This is called an underdoor attack and it is as dumb as it looks. It is a rod and a string. You swing around to that inside handle. You yank on that string. That is the door right there. Again, by code. In fact, in hospitality environments, Almost every system nowadays, even if someone flips the widget and the wonk it and the turn and the night bot, if you hit that handle, the dead latch will usually, the, the dead lock, the night lock will usually disengage the dead bolt, everything gets thrown, that door is open. This is that direct and simple. The underdoor attack is something that we have been exploiting so much because it's really hard to guard the bottom gap on that door. This is something that, unless you're dealing with an exterior door, you know, and you don't care about environmentals on an interior door, like, most of the time, get on your, get down and look at your doors. Sometimes the gaps are massive, way bigger than you would need. And anybody can fabric cobble these together, right? I mean, this is an actual commercial one, and I saw somebody else owns one because I know the box that it comes in over there. Uh, but this is, you know, Keydex is the company that made the original, the K22. Uh, we've modified this a little bit. I actually really, really like putting a retractable uh, line on it, just so you don't have to police up the big line flopping all over on you. But th this is a destroyer of worlds when we're doing our kind of penetration and covert entry work. And as somebody was talking to me, like, what if you're in a hospitality environment? What if you're in a hotel? What if you have to make sure you're clear in a floor? Like, it's not a fire on that floor, but you're like, all right, we've got to make sure these guests are all out. Ew. You know, your strobes are going, people are asleep, it's annoying. Are you going to break every single door? Are you going to pay, who's going to pay for that? Is the hotel manager going to be angry about that? Or can one or two person teams go down an entire hallway in 60 seconds to slip, look, bam, slip, look, bam, slip, look, bam. This is a really nice, and it's bigger and bulkier than we might like, right? You're not keeping this in your coat pocket. But having at least one in the back of someone's car, really nice to have around, man. And you can attack crash bars. It's not as easy. There are variants of this tool. Some of them have a little claw that'll help to dig into the crash bar. Um, we have, there's a whole bunch more intricate stuff we could get into. But you know, when we when we show this in, uh, in our classroom, we have a wide variety of these that get modified over the years. And one way or another, you can almost all if there's a gap in that bottom of the door, and it's a modern commercial style door, you know, com compliant with code, almost always an underdoor attack is going to be a very effective way to get in. Oh, and you can also do it on old, non-compliant doors, too. There are weird versions that have kind of rubber. It's like what you would put on your shelving in the cabinets. There are ways to try to engage with door handles to start pulling both ways, and you can kind of twist, and eventually even get a door handle, door knob, sorry, turning. And this is not a new concept. This is a really old article, probably from the National Locksmith. Uh, I'm not sure what issue this was in, but like, if you look at this guy's glasses and mustache, it was not, yes, not last week. 
Uh, so like this is these these tools have been around, right? Like locksmiths have known about these tools, but locksmiths are a very closed world. That kind of knowledge doesn't leak out into the public as much as it might be able to help folk like you all. So we've gone under the door. What if we go over the door? And I don't just mean going through drop ceilings, which I do sometimes do on penetration jobs. Uh, no, this is just an extra fun way of approaching this. Uh, going over the door, many door handles you can lift up, just as you can lift down and pull them down. It might be a little hard to tell. What am I using? What's coming over this door here? Yeah, for the young ones in the room, that, that used to be called film. And that's how you would take pictures before the iPhone. So I'm literally just sh shoving a length of film over this door, and I know how far down the handle is. How do I know that? Yeah, I'm on the other side of the freaking door. I can see the other handle, for Christ's sake. So yeah, you just walk this over, and then you give it a yank. And that will coil up real small and fit in the pocket. Now, if you've got smoke and flame on the inside, that's probably going to shrivel up and blow away. But if it's, again, a non-priority entry, sometimes getting over the door, if, especially if you have a door sill, if you have you know, some sort of weird uh, interlocking door sill cap, which is common, again, on exterior doors for, for not letting stuff blow in and rain blowing in, uh, going over the door will sometimes work instead. And these are all real easy things to practice. They're easy things to make your own. I'm not trying to... I'm not up here selling you anything. I don't work for any of these catalogs or anything like that. Uh, I, I love a story of somebody who said they were stuck in one side of a garage and they couldn't get back because like a door blew shut or something. They were in a warehouse. And when they found a strap, they found polymer, like it's not brick strap, it's polymer crate strapping, you know? So they just took a bunch of it and they figured they could shove it over the door and kind of just, well, maybe I feel something. Gave it a yank, got the door open, worked just fine. Hotels. We've talked a little bit now about hotels. And how many of you do respond to hotel environments for various things, right? Um, sometimes it's welfare call-outs, sometimes it's, you know, there's a lot of reasons that you're dealing with hotel doors, and they, they introduce certain other problems. Uh, we've seen that a lot of hotel locks are susceptible to that underdoor attack. And frankly, a lot of hotel locks, just the door construction is not always as robust as would make people feel comfortable. So what do people do? They use the night lock, right? flip the little night lock over. There's a lot of different varieties of this type of lock. Uh, this is one of the most common that's still out there. Super easy to pop this open. If you're not familiar, uh, this tool right here. Has anyone seen one of these? I'm getting some nods and some no's. Okay, a lot of those exist under various brand names, but uh, the lock jockey is probably one of the originals. And it's simplistic as simplistic gets, right? The door can open just enough for you to get the lock jockey in there, and then if you smash the door shut, you'll actually wind up banging it in a way that invariably pops that little lock right open. Here we go. All right, put it in place. That was it, do we see that? It's kind of dark, let's watch that again. Open the door, which of course jams into that night lock, but you can get the lock jockey, and then just pull hard shut. It actually just springs as soon as you, the harder you pull the door to you, the more spring action you get, and you can knock that night lock right out of the way. And then if you're either using your under door tool, or maybe, you're, maybe you've been given like the manager is like there, and they want to let you in because, oh, there was a shortness of breath call, and the, now we can't get to the guest. Oh, the night lock is on. And a lot of hotels have these, by the way. A lot of hotels, the, 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 the maintenance staff will know what this is. They might even have one if you're like, oh, shoot, we don't, do you have a night lock tool? They might have one. Again, you don't have to go bashing the door down. And it's not very expensive, right? Um, like 29 bucks, I've, seen, I've honestly seen people do this trick with just, again, just plain polymer. I've seen it done with the do not disturb sign, where you can kind of shove the, like you just kind of barely get the door shut, but you shove the sign at the same time, and you got this little ripple, and then it springs. And you know, what's it cost you to try? An extra three seconds. What do I do, by the way, in hotels? When I say, what do I use in hotels? This is not me getting in. This is when I want to get a solid eight hours down on the rack, and I don't want anyone coming in the room, and I'm like, I don't know, this place looks kind of shady. Uh, if you do a lot of, you know, if you go on the road, if you have family that goes out on the road, uh, two things I really like on the defensive side, and again, I don't work for these companies. Uh, Lee Valley Tools, I do some woodworking, but I love that they make, if you're not familiar, Lee Valley makes really nice, you know, old-timey Bob Viola woodworking tools, but this is one of their hottest sellers. And it's just a wedge of metal with, you know, a threaded screw through it. 
It is called a security doorstop, and it's as simple as you think. You shove it under the door, and you start cranking down on that, hopefully not on a ceramic floor, hopefully it's on carpet or wood. But if you, if you give this a few turns, I mean, that door's not coming open at all. Then, then you all get to bring out the irons and start breaking things. Uh, another thing that's a little heavy, it's got some gravity in it, which I guess is good if, you know, if someone does break in the hotel room, you can give them a good thump. But if you want something lighter that you can keep in a carry-on bag, um, I've, I, I thought this was hokey when I first saw it. Somebody showed it to me, and I bought one, and I kind of use it all the time in hotels. Uh, it, is, it is a thumb turn strap, and no matter what kind of door you have, there's usually some configuration that you can figure out with this strap to go around it and to prevent, even if someone literally underdoors it, you can yank as much as you want on that handle and it's probably not going to turn. It's not going to release the deadbolt. So a lot of hotels that I've stayed at over the years, I find some way of twisting this around and getting it to secure. It's Velcro. It secures to itself. So I kind of like that a lot. And who knows, maybe you're in a situation where you're trying an entry like this with the, you know, another door tool, like, why is it just not working? Maybe that's what's going on on the inside. Uh, fun tip, we used to use a lot of um, like bore scopes and things when we do penetration gigs to see what's on the other side of the door, uh, especially on those door knob attacks, that's really hard to execute blind. So we would send a bore scope under and you're looking at a screen. Um, improvised bore scope, improvised to see on the other side of the door. If you have a smartphone, uh, just turn on the camera put it on selfie mode, and if you can slide it under the door, the selfie camera is usually at the top of the, cap of the phone, so you can get about half the phone under the door and you can see the other side on the screen. You can get to, even if you're just trying an underdoor attack, and you're like, am I on it, am I not on it? Well, look at your phone. Sometimes if uh, you're not worried about smashing on it, you know, you can get, get eyes on the other side of the door, that helps. Changing gears, changing gears to key boxes. How, how is this, pay? are we, do you like have questions? Or you're just all kind of staring at me dumbfounded. Is this like really this wild? Because to me, this is just work, right? But I'm loving that people are kind of, I'm seeing notes being taken, this is, this is awesome. Um, now we're, we're safely back in a lot of, of your territory, right? Knox boxes. Also known more officially as rapid entry boxes, if you're curious, uh, in the lock world. Because Knox is not the only player, uh, they're the biggest player by far. Uh, but if you're not familiar with these, I mean, I think, quick show of hands, who knows what the Knox box is, right? Like, that's way more than half this room. Um, I've always been fascinated in being, uh, about how different departments keep the Knox key maintained. Uh, you know, so many times, because obviously, if, if for those, a handful of people in this room who don't know, rapid entry boxes are designed to allow first responder ingress by, you know, it used to be that like every major building in town would like, all right, keep the keys with the fire company. And then the fire company was like, well, we don't want that kind of responsibility and that's a lot of stuff to manage. So Knox and other players said, all right, here's what you do. Put a Knox box on your building, put your key in the Knox box, and then give just one key to the fire company in town. And that's, that's neat as long as no one compromises that key. So where that Knox key gets kept, a lot of times nowadays it's in the cab of the trucks, right? You have different pin code or authentication tokens that are used to unlock the Knox key. Uh, because again, you wouldn't want that to fall into the wrong hands. I understand that. That would be a bit, oh, that would be bad, wouldn't it? There are stories like this that I don't quite comprehend. How the F do you lose eight, how do you have 850 keys? We don't, we're not sure with this headline, because Knox is based in Phoenix. That's where we have one of our offices. Did, like, Knox lose the keys? I have no idea how this happens. I do know that uh, up where I live now in Seattle, there, there was a couple, and that was their jam. They had compromised a, a fire first responder key, and they were using it to break in two front doors, mostly just for package theft and ticky-tack stuff. But the idea of understanding the validity, this is for the handful of people in this room who don't encounter these, like, understand what the Knox box is, understand why the keys do matter, understand why, like, maybe supervisor can't just hand the key out, there's a whole process, there's a reason for it. Like, compromise of the Knox key is bad in different towns. And it's also, I have a whole gallery of just funny Knox box photos. This is not a funny photo, this makes sense. This is a Knox box, you know, mounted into the masonry, like, that's how it's supposed to be. This is weird. This is just a Knox box on a pole. Like, I'm, I'm not the biggest guy in the world, but I could come up with a sledgehammer and knock that off of there. And for me, I'm not interested in getting, like, the key for that building. I'm interested in the fact that as a covert entry technician, if I compromise the lock, I can then get the pinning 
for the Knox key for that region. And that this is one of the ways Knox keys leak. Maybe not a Knox box on a pole, maybe like it's a Knox box on vinyl siding. Good job, that makes a lot of sense. Or a fence. Someone's like, hey, I heard because of fire code, the Knox box has to be accessible. We've got this construction site. Hey, Phil, can you move the Knox box on a fence? Yeah, that's a good job. I think that's lunch, right, boys? I have a gallery of a bunch of photos of open Knox boxes, which is, are bad. Like, I was walking home from a bar with a, there's another company called In Guardians that does some of the same work we do. And I'm walking with the, the guys from In Guardians, and we're just walking through Seattle. I'm like, oh, dude, check it out, check it out! Knox box! And next to it, by the way, is Supra. Uh, Supra is another player in that industry. I was like, oh, dude, a Knox box, Knox box, the real valuable one. Check this, this would be awesome. And I swung it open, I was like, oh, oh, damn it. I thought I was going to have the lock in it. That was going to, wait. Oh man, that's way worse actually. <laughs> so yeah, like just locks boxes with no keys, not boxes open. There's one kid who keeps sending me this photo from Sacramento of a Knox box that hasn't been locked for like years. I'm not sure why. It's just open and every time he goes by, he tweets me a picture. And I'm like, oh man, Knox box still unlocked? I'm like, mm, yeah, Knox box still unlocked. Uh, by the way, for those who don't know, like Knox boxes do support wiring into an alarm system. I don't know if any, like this one was not wired, he just tugged on it, he was like, oh yeah, they're not hooked up. Um, has anyone ever done a Knox box open that has caused an alarm? I mean, usually if you're responding, there's already an alarm. Well, did you have an alarm go off when you opened it, or no? Okay. Yeah, so sometimes opening the Knox box will set off a screamer. Most of the time, they're not hooked up, in my, in my experience. But yeah, op open Knox boxes everywhere. If you, if you keep looking at stuff like me, because I'm the crazy person that doesn't just walk in you know, to the Dick's Sporting Goods and get what I need. I'm like looking at the, oh, Adam's right. Oh, this Knox box. What kind of camera system do they use? Oh, Genetech. So maybe you'll start seeing the world the way I do, and you'll start noticing weird key boxes around. Like this is, this is just brilliant to me. This is awesome. This, none of these are rapid entry boxes, right? These are not Knox boxes or Supra. Uh, what they are, however, are very, you get this in a lot of situations where there's shared infrastructure on certain, certain buildings now. Uh, High-rise buildings in a lot of cities will have things like cellular infrastructure on the roof, they'll have telecom equipment or other equipment where you need to have like a technician and they, you know, he or she comes out like once every six months to fiddle with the whatever and they need their key, but they don't go to the management because they have this fun arrangement where they just put a, put a box on them and then somebody else, Verizon, comes along and puts a box and then like Comcast puts their box. All of these, including this one, are pretty much hot garbage. Uh, Any time that key box, man, key boxes by their nature, usually you don't lock up a key with another key. Usually key boxes are combination based. That's very typical, right? Anytime you see these multi-wheel combination boxes, uh, and there's just a, I have so many. This is the Master 5400 series. You can get it with the little uh, shackle on it. You can get the one that mounts to the wall like we saw. You can get them in bulk, I guess, if you really need a ton of them. <laughs> there's a whole service now that's sort of like Uber for dog walking, I guess you would call it. It's called WAG, where you don't, need, like, you don't need to know your personal dog walker. You just have WAG. And then you, you know, oh, I'm gonna be out of town for a day, like someone from WAG, come over. And WAG will send you this and say, put it on your house so that WAG people can come over. Every one of these are just I'm like, oh God, when I see these, because they're, they're a nightmare. They are all super decodable. We can do this later. I have some, uh, some multi-wheel locks we can try to play with, but there's videos online that I, I, I throw a bunch of, I don't, I'm not like this very great YouTuber. I'm not very consistent with when I throw videos up. But if you poke at my channel, like, I have a whole, this is how you decode a lockbox video. It's just a few minutes long, and sticking a thin piece of metal down into the lockbox is usually enough to feel where those wheels want to grab, and you just pop, the, pop it right open, right? We were doing effectively that kind of attack without any tools on this one padlock that's sitting here. We can do a decoding attack with no tools at all. I can teach you that, too. Uh, so yeah, all of these, all of these are like probably going to contain the building's master key. So we've got like eight copies of the master key outside of this back door. So even if the Knox box is properly secured, you will walk around the property, you might find like, oh, maybe we don't have to take the key out of the key secure. Maybe they just have it behind a twelve-dollar box from Home Depot. By the way, not all these are multi-wheel locks. I can spot a couple of little kitty access points. That's another kitty is actually made by Supra. But uh, little push-button jobs, right? So we've got one here, we've got one here. 
Let's take a look at those. Let's look a little more closely. Do you think there's any attacks or exploits against these? Yes, absolutely, there are. Uh, they're annoying. Most of the attacks and exploits against push-button boxes like this involve pressing really hard on the release button and trying the buttons one at a time to like see which one feels grabby and which one doesn't. And Different brands and models of lock are easier or harder to decode. I will give you this one, though, for free because if you look closely at most of these buttons, people who set these up often don't change the code. Between the left and the right push button, which one looks like it gets love and attention from a nice human, you know, skin-oiled finger every day, and which one looks like it hasn't been touched since Reagan was president? <laughs> right? Exactly. This is the one that's getting rubbed constantly by someone's hand. This one, not so much. Well, knowing that, let's do a little walk around, right? What do we think? What do we think about number one? I like number one for this combination, absolutely. What do we think about number two? Mm, I don't think so. Three? Three, you can see the dust on it, for God's sake. How about number four? Pretty good candidate, in my mind. Five? What do you think? I think five's looking good. You can be louder here. Come on, this is the participation section. We're halfway there. Six? No. Seven? Not at all. No, not at all. How about nine? Oh, nine. How about zero? I'd say no. So we liked one, we liked four, maybe five, we liked nine. When you have any codes that ever involve a one and a nine, what is something they might have done? A year. A year, absolutely. Do you know why this one's even easier to figure out? Doesn't matter which order you put the buttons in. Any of these little access points, you can just push them any other at all. So if you think you've got some candidates, just try them, try them, and try the boom, boom, boom. So absolutely, you, anybody can do that. Just looking at it, look closely at it for a second. And I realize on an, on an exigent circumstance, you're not sitting there and like, well, hold on, like, this is a fun challenge. It's like the Sunday crossword and someone's coding out on the third floor. But yeah, if you run into these boxes, you might be, might be able to get yourself in. What about just plain old padlocks, right? Exterior of a property, run into padlocks. And again, like you've got bolt cutters, you've got just two big wrenches that you can crack on them. There's a whole technique with the Halligan bar, and then you hit it with the axe. Like I've, I've learned that once long ago. But I'm going to show you the four most popular padlocks basically in America, and you're going to run into these a lot, and you don't have to destroy any of them if you don't want to. Starting on the end, this is an example of what will be called a warded padlock. Now, you can't quite tell that from the outside, but I'll explain what's going on here, and I'll explain how it works on the inside. So these warded locks, in interior, they don't actually use intricate pins and springs. They have a very rudimentary like release latch mechanism. So the fun thing here, and I can just walk you through with a little example video. I have examples here that we can try out later on if you want. I'm just going to reach in with this. That's not the proper key. That is called a warded pick. And it's, it's barely any kind of picking at all. Let me just turn my sound off there. So, we've got our warded pick. The, the biggest problem with using a warded pick, and you'll all get to try this tonight, I want you to have room to screw it up before you're in the field, is getting the pick stuck. But traveler hook to the rescue, not just for slipping latches. And you get your warded pick back out, and bam. Bam, bam, bam. Every one of these locks, even though they all take different keys, inside is the same mechanism. It's a single release latch bar that you can just reach in and nail with this tool. Let's show you the inside. I got a little diagram for you and you can see what's happening and why this is possible, right? This is the type of key that would operate these locks. Have you seen keys that look kind of like this before? Like very square wave cuts, always a dead giveaway. That's a warded lock. Inside, like again, it looks like a laminated steel, it got the rivets, like it looks like a padlock. Well, what's happening inside? Why is it called a warded lock? Wards are protrusions of metal that stick into the keyway. Many times we'll talk about wards and warding when you're looking at the keyway of a lock. So the profile of the, of the keyway, that, that's warding defines that profile. But not just in a locksmithing sense of like which key line can go in. You can have a lock where it's just a big open channel, but there are these protrusions on the sides. These are the wards, the wards that are designed to get in the way. 
Now, this might be a little unclear what you're about to see. The wards are off to the side. So the key, any key, can slip in the keyway. Like, does this make sense? The key is sliding past the wards on the sides. Any key can go in, but it has to be a key complementary to the warding if you want it to turn. That is how warded locks work. And if the key can turn, it can grab that one release latch, you know, trigger it, bam, pops open. The wrong key, a different lock's key, can get in, but it, it can't turn. But when you think about this, this is an entirely inverted security model. Normally, well, the, the, the pin tumbler lock, the one we showed you the very first animation tonight, a pin tumbler lock, the lock has all the power. You stick a key in, and the lock, if, if it were cognizant, the lock is like, hmm, are you the correct key for me? Let's see if I will be allowed to turn, because the pins are what's binding. With a warded lock, it's flipped, right? The key goes in, and the key is like, all right, am I the correct key? Can I turn? But the key has all the power. The, key, the only thing stopping the key from turning is other parts of the key. So what do people do before pick tools existed? What they did, they would just shave off the whole key. This is where the origin of the term skeleton key comes from. You take a key, you trim away all the extra flesh, and you're left with nothing but the bare bones, the skeleton. That will reach in, that will hit the release lever, that will trip not only that warded lock, but every warded lock that's of the same rough size. So that's what we have here. We have warded pick tools. They are basically just stamped metal skeleton keys. And they will make mincemeat out of these warded locks, day in and day out. Obviously, everyone has seen this padlock, right? Like, this is the quintessential American gym locker, like padlock in school. How many people have heard of padlock shimming? There's like a third of the room. Oh man, this is wild. Normally you bring a bunch of professional like entry team guys in, like, oh, I've heard of shimming. But this is, uh, this is great, this is your day to learn something new, it's so fun. This is a thin piece of metal called a locksmith shim or a padlock shim. We're gonna slide it right down next to the shackle. And if you can imagine, inside the lock, there's a latch, yes. But the latch inside this lock is just spring-loaded. If you ever have a lock like this that's open and you wanna snap it shut, it's not like you're dialing the combination, you just snap it shut because that latch inside there is a spring-loaded latch. Well, if you have a thin enough piece of metal that you can slip down into the keyway, you can just slide that latch out of the way and pop the lock right off. Now, in the, uh, in the photo here, we actually have a proper locksmith, you know, produced catalog shim made out of spring steel. This is not, this is not made out of spring steel. What is that made of? That is a beverage can, absolutely. And I even brought some uh, scraps of metal with me if you want to try this. I might I don't have to drink a couple more beers or something to get you more, but we have some, we have some locks here. We can, we can try this later on. If you want anything you're seeing up here, I tried to bring demos, and we have Zach's tools over here that are demos, right? So the idea of shoving a piece of a beer can down into the lock, like, and it makes me feel at home. I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, New Jersey area. I live in Pacific Northwest now, but I can always, I like to always have the can of Yinzer in there whenever I show this presentation around the country. So yeah, shoving a piece of beer can in there, twisting, jamming it in, spring that lock open without having, I know it's a cheap lock. Like I know the user of that lock could just replace it if you had to smash it off or cut it off. But being able to save someone a couple bucks, being able to, in a, how many environments are you in where it's your objective is to establish what's going on and make sure everything's safe, but in a nice day, you want to be able to lock it back up so you can leave, and you're not leaving someone's property unsecured. This is a way to do that, and it's, it's basically no damage, no skin off you. It's pretty simple. One of the coolest ones, because again, anyone in this room can do this with no real hard times. The tiny 40 millimeter style, as we would call them in locksmith catalogs, 40 millimeter style padlocks, they are ubiquitous. These little guys, I mean, like, you, again, you see these on the retail shelves everywhere. Not always branded master. Uh, Briggs makes a copy, no name copies. There's a, everyone loves that form factor. It is like the cheap kind of hardware store padlock. Those are often ridiculously exploitable by what are called comb tools. What are comb tools? Well, these are comb tools. You stick them in the lock and you turn and the lock falls open. And then you pick up another lock and you stick it in and then the lock falls open. 
This is not like magic. I'm just gonna like I don't know if you're thinking that I'm making this up or I'm I'm pretending what's going on here. I might have a comb pick around. If I do, well I can find one in a minute. I got one in my wallet probably as well. We can comb these open. In fact, here I think I should have a comb pick here. I feel like I'm not doing enough live demos. This is this is like you know I really should be putting myself on the line and seeing if I can can do this or not, right? Because then you can believe me that I'm not just making all this up. So comb tool on my little, uh, well, we'll talk about what this is in a minute. Proper lock, I'll pass this all around later, right? Reach up, jam it in. I gotta tighten this guy up slightly. We still having fun? All right, all right. I should be able to spring that open. This is, this is not a trick lock. This is right off the retail rack. And every one of these is vulnerable. Comb picks, huge sets of them are popular in locksmith catalogs because weird, obscure locks in Europe are vulnerable to these. In America, like the most popular lock ever is the one that's vulnerable. And if you want, here's what's happening, by the way. It's not crazy hard to understand, right? Comb picking, first of all, shouldn't be possible. Here's our diagram from earlier, right? You got these pin stacks. The red ones are called key pins. The blue ones are called driver pins. Now, if you were to reach in with like a pick tool or a bent wire and just try to push on those pins, the spring above them will compress, but it's not like you could push them all the way out of the plug, like way up into the housing. But of course, that's a particularly large pin stack that I chose just then. Let's, let's go with the shortest one, the tiniest, not the fourth position, right? Ah, still can't get it up out of the housing. The housing doesn't have enough room up in the top cap. But what if it did? Like, this is a stupid design. There's no reason to build a lock like that. And if you were making just a lock cylinder that was installed in a doorknob or a deadbolt, you'd never have that. The housing around the plug in a padlock is typically the lock body itself. Like, the lock body has to be this big to fit on this size shackle. So all they do is they just mold the housing around the plug. That gives you enough room to get in there with a comb, get under the pins, lift and jam, and then there's no pins in the lock at this moment. You can just spin the plug around. That's all comb lifting or overlifting, as it's called, is. And again, like you've seen these locks. You know they are out there. You see them on store shelves right now. They are all vulnerable to this right now on the retail shelves. One more padlock. Perhaps the most exploitable padlock of the bunch, the Master 175. Again, not everyone wants to carry keys. Like job sites, work sites, a lot of outdoor situations, you'll, you'll find this padlock everywhere. The multi-wheel brass kind of colored padlock. Internally, this padlock is exploitable with a simple thin piece of metal that would rock against a tiny plate and just reach in, stick in the right spot, press on it, ka-choink, lock flies open. I'll show you a little video about it. I have examples of it up here if you want to try it. You can do this. Reaching in, this is the same thin bit of metal that I was showing in the decoding, decoding key boxes, same piece of metal. I keep one under my phone case, just under the rubber of my phone case so I can spring out when I need it. But if I get it in the right spot, squeeze the shackle, which is how you normally would open the lock, but instead I'm just gonna rock this tool and the lock pops apart. There is a small plate inside this lock that needs to rock into a certain position. Normally, it would rock into position. You can actually see it in this cutaway here. Normally, if you dial the wheels correctly, there's a, what's called the, the fingers will drop into these gates on the wheel, and they will allow it to rock down. Well, think of a seesaw, right? A seesaw, if one side rocks down, the other side can pop up. Well, this is like a seesaw where the center fulcrum isn't bolted down. So you don't care if one side of the seesaw can go down, you just go over to the side you want and just lift it up. And that's all we're doing. We're reaching in with a thin piece of metal under that plate so that we can spring it upward. Here's a nice long-handled version of the same kind of attack tool, right? Reach in between the wheels, get under that plate, and you'll all do this if you want to. I mean, there's a whole hell of a lot of you, you might break the tool before we get everybody. But that little piece, that little plate, just has to rock up and out of the way. Stab in. 
You can go in between any of the wheels, but I tend to like, you can go to the left side of any of the wheels. Being centrally located is best, so the third wheel is usually your best, best candidate. The left of the third wheel is about as middle as you can be. You will all do this if you want to. You can all try this. And this master is not the only one who makes this design. The original design was made by Sesame, and Master knocked it off, and then Brinks knocked off Master, and then Master made a black version. Every one of these is vulnerable. Absolutely, every one of these is vulnerable. And it's so vulnerable that Master has finally started to say, look, all right, people just will not stop buying this 175. It's making us look pretty bad because we're a punching bag on the internet. Let's make a new one that looks almost like it, but isn't exploitable. That's what they did. If you look at hardware stores now, you'll often see a very similar looking padlock. But it has these ridges down the side. That is one indicator and a few other indicators that you can spot if you're a locksmith. Oh, that's the new one. That's the 875. That's the revised version. And their big thing was like, hooray, we're finally no longer vulnerable to the stupid, you know, thin lift attack. But as we all played around before the talk started, right? What were we doing before we started with the uh, with the combos? You were rocking the numbers back and forth, and you could feel a little bit of play in it. Yeah, was it was it like hard to do? <laughs> no, like, we we were just waiting for people to come in. I was just handing this lock one down the line down the line and saying, "Here, change the combination." And then I'd play with it for a minute and be like, "All right, was this your combination?" It's like a card trick. Uh, essentially, this lock is decodable with no tools at all, and I'll teach you how to do that if you want to. And, like, does it take a few minutes? Maybe. But between that versus destroying the whole lock? Or what if you have a situation where there's a perimeter lock and then there's a code, but there's a code pad or a digital keypad somewhere that you might be able to get in? Maybe someone's reusing the combination. Maybe spending 30 seconds or a minute with a combination lock on a gate. They're like, ooh, 1776, someone's a American Revolution. Yeah, try that on the code on the door. 1770, oh wow, cool. Nice, that opened. Boom. People reuse pins and passwords, you know? So what about better padlocks? What about higher security padlocks? Because they're out there. There are nice, big, beefy padlocks. You go to a locksmith, maybe not to Home Depot or Lowe's, but a locksmith, like he or she might sell you something like this. You might get like the big old American 700 series. This is a very popular style of big, big cut resistant, you know, destruction resistant, high security lock. And it's also rekeyable, okay? I'm not here selling you the American padlock, which doesn't really get sold anymore because Masterlock bought them, and they're kind of shoving them quietly out of the retail space. But one of the people would tout, like, oh, it's a rekeyable lock, it's a double, it's a what's called a double ball mechanism, it's not shimmable. The double ball mechanism is visible, and if we look at this part of the internal workings, this is a cammed control actuator here. So basically, you have solid steel ball bearings that need to fall inward to let the shackle clear. And unless that cammed cylinder turns, well, the ball bearings cannot fall inward. So, all right, nice, robust design, and the, 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 the plug is ejectable, you can rekey it. Yeah, I like it. But remember that Adams Wright wire? We were able to attack the Adams Wright commercial dead latch. Why? Because the keyway, like all keyways, is broached all the way through the plug. Same with the master, uh, same with, well, not master, same with American lock, right? This exists. This is not a lock pick. This is a bypass tool. This is sometimes called a bypass driver. The idea is, it looks like a little lock pick tool, it's not. You can shove this all the way through the plug just to that cammed control actuator and just smack it and pop the lock right open. This giant, like this is, if you go to a locksmith, or again, old movie references, if you remember the movie Clerks, like, Dante is like, oh, someone jammed gum in the locks. Like, you see these locks on storefronts at night when the metal cladding comes down. Reach in, push, ka-chunk. Biggest, baddest lock that you can find a lot of times, even in a locksmith shop, and it can be vulnerable to this bypass driver attack. That is mind-blowing to me. Now, are there some locks that try to mitigate for this? Yes, there are. American lock, in fact, when the original tool came out, they made a little bit of a plate that would kind of block this. So the original tool maker made a little wafer plate breaker that you stick in a blade, you punch it, and the plate breaks, and then you stick the first tool back in, it still works. Electronic doors. It is the modern age, right? Many locks are not just mechanical anymore. 
Many locks are electronic in nature. Now I realize electronical bits can be intimidating. Many of you are ladders and irons, you're not wires and pliers. I get that. So we're gonna keep this really simple. Like I'm gonna dumb it way down. And if you're upset about that, if you're a firefighter, just pretend I'm talking to the badges in the room. And if you're an officer on the job, just pretend I'm talking to the EMS in the room. And if you, blue light is all three, I'm talking to your CL. So we're gonna keep this really simple, right? A really simple circuitry. Now you're familiar, right? You're familiar with kind of motion sensors. If you go into and out of a convenience store or a hotel, you might have encountered, in fact, situations where motion sensors can be one way, many times after hours. Hotel lobby, great example. Like, if you leave the hotel, doors just open, but on the way in, daytime, they'll open, but at nighttime, it's a like use room key, you know? Has anyone seen something like that? Of course. That doesn't mean you can't trip the interior one. What am I doing here? I'm in a hotel lobby. It's obviously not letting me in, and then it lets me in. What I did is there's just one of those display racks of like, see the mystic caverns and raft the rapids, like those like tourist things, and I just grabbed one. What did I do with it before I stuck it through? Yeah, I shoved it under my arm, warmed it up. Most of these sensors, most modern motion sensors are not microwave. They used to be like old timey, like if you had an old uh, like microwave radar detector in your car and it would go off if you drive past at a grocery store. None of those are microwave anymore. They're almost all passive infrared. Passive infrared is cheaper, uh, it's more reliable, it's easier to install. You don't have to tune it quite as much. PIR sensors, passive infrared sensors, in many installations, these are even referred to, not just a hotel lobby, this is a proper business, right? They're referred to as REX sensors, R-E-X, request to exit sensor. And they are exploitable because again, if you have an electronically locked door, if you have a mag lock, like you can see there's magnetic locks in this door. If someone's inside and needs to get out, well, you've got to cut power to those magnets. You're not flipping a switch on the wall, usually. Usually you walk up, the REX sensor sees you, and it just unlocks the door. If it's a solenoid powered door, sometimes the solenoid lock will be put under power, which is weird. You normally wouldn't need that. Normally you'd just be able to mechanically use the handle. But Coastal Fire, I said they were going to be in here, right? They have great video showing this. Now, the crew in that video, are they sticking paper through the door? No, those are really sealed tight, those doors, right? But they're tripping those rec sensors, right? What are they using? Yes, they're using this super elite hacker tool known as compressed air from your local stables. Uh, if you want, like, what you can do, I mean, you can take a can of compressed air and you can flip it over. Uh, we used to do that when the cat would jump off on something that it shouldn't be, be like, pff, 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 get out of there. The cat was running away. Um, and that's fine. Uh, the, the, the refrigerant will kind of just boil off when it comes out. If you want a more reliable version, you can speak to like MG Chemical or um, Tech Spray is another brand. You can get these at actual electronic stores. Uh, they, it, it's actual R134 refrigerant. It's usually colder. And it often has a dip tube, so you don't have to actually flip it inverted. Uh, and it will be very reliable in a way to trip those sensors. The idea is these sensors see temperature differential. All they can tell is something on the other side is no longer the same temperature. That must be a person. I have to let someone in or out. Hello. <laughs> it's great, right? Like, it, these sensors are not that smart of a device. And frankly, integrators and installers will tune these sensors to really pick up anything they can. The last thing an integrator wants is to have a customer who keeps calling them out and be like, oh man, I was walking with this big bag of boxes and it knocked the, the door knocked me over. Can you make this thing more sensitive, please? No one ever asked their integrator, please make it detect less people. Like no one, that's not a question an integrator gets asked. So they're going to make sure that lens, that Fresnel lens, is calibrated to as much coverage as it can possibly be. And again, like hot or cold, as long as there's a temperature differential, this will unlock the door. And I really love the innovation going on. Like, the, the can of air is cool. Uh, a buddy of mine, Dave, he 
you know, he's a big vape guy, so I think he sub owns his coils on his e-cig rig. So he blow, he blows these really fat clouds, right? So one day he's like, all right, well we got this we got this door, maybe I could try this. And his buddy bends on the inside recording, and he's just trying to listen for the sound of that circuitry clicking. And he's like, all right, maybe I can get it, maybe I can get it. Now unlocked. All right, there you go. So yeah literally entering a building in a cloud of smoke, something that you're all very good at. Uh, I don't smoke, but I do drink. So one night I was with my wife, before she was my wife, um, I used to live in Montana, and we had kind of wandered out of a bar one night, we were going place to place, and I just kind of walked out with a whiskey, because who gives a damn? And I was like, hey, hey, check it out. Look at this door, I want to show you something. And she, she was like, I don't know what he's doing, but I know him. She gets her phone out, just, well, I'll let you see what happened. see. Now there are better sensors on the market, they're not as common. Uh, this top one, the Honeywell, Honeywell IS310, man, it is rebadged and resold. Um, you'll start seeing that one everywhere if you start looking. I might even see one on this building, I don't know, we'll look around. Uh, the one below it is made by GE, it's a higher security sensor. It does use passive infrared, but it also uses microwave radar, it uses them together. So it's called the RCR, the Range Controlled Radar Rex. And so sometimes you're like looking at a glass frontage, you're like, I'm just looking at the freaking Rex. You're dumping all this air through it. By the way, the other reason that you might use a tech spray or freeze spray, it doesn't have bitterant in it. Uh, the stuff from Staples does, you know, to prevent like dumbass teens from trying to huff it in the woods. I don't know why you would. Uh, but like the, the stuff from Staples, canned air has bitterant in it. So if you ever gas a door and walk through it, don't breathe in for a second, because you'll be like, <laughs> Why'd I do that? Uh, tech spray doesn't have that. But even if you've got that deep freeze spray and you're dumping it through the door and you're like, it's not opening, uh, it might be like a, a radar-based one. That's really uncommon outside of like a government building. Why? More cost, harder to tune. In a secure kind of environment, the most common thing you might see is like a push-to-exit button. Do you spot it? Little green button over there? Yeah, sometimes you can see them show up. Now, again, commonly used, not always commonly used well. This is kind of an example of it used sort of well. It ha again, we got code. If someone is not ambulatory, if someone's in a wheelchair and they hit a button, the door needs to be close enough that they can then like get the door and get it open. <laughs> you can't put the button like way down the hall. And that means that if you can reach the button, you've got yourself a problem. Locked. <laughs> like, that's funny. I'll laugh, but again, like, they're hemmed in by code. Code compliance says the button has to be there. And if you've got me, I've seen people do it with an under door tool, not going under the door, just going kind of through a gap and looking and, you know, smack on it, smack on it, hit it a couple times and get the button to pop. There are ways in a lot of times. This. Again, in the electronics world, how are we doing on time? We still, we still hanging in? We still having a good time here? Oh, yeah. All right, all right, we're still doing good. So, entrance intercoms, access control boxes. This one right here, this one is by a company called Linear. And when I tell you that if you start looking, you're gonna start seeing a lot of the same brands around America. Linear is a huge player in this market. Is it shocking to anyone at this point that every Lanier box since about 1992 is the same key? <laughs> this little black head silver double-sided key, the 222343 key, this is the key that opens all the Lanier cabinets, unless they've been rekeyed, which is a special order, which most people never think about doing, because why? It's got a lock on it, I'm good. No, you look, and these aren't restricted keys. They're in like catalogs for installers and such. By the way, a little like, you're going to trip yourself up on terminology trying to order this thing. Why is it, it says linear, but it says A126. Why is that? 
long time and long, long ago, the A126 key was a super popular cabinet key, and it was used on early generation linear cabinets. It no longer is. It has not been for decades. Catalogs still sometimes call it that. But the 22234 key, the, the key that has the double-sided bidding and the black head, 222343 key, or just look for linear key, that is the key that opens linear cabinets. And what's inside? Oh, electronicals and parts. Don't worry, don't worry, I got you. I got you, fam. This is not this hard. Let's look around. Yeah, we got big black pieces here doing something. This one's not doing anything anymore. <laughs> that one had the magic smoke come out. These are relays. These are relays, and they're all going to the wires that you see on these big terminal blocks. So you've got clear pairs of wires coming in. Relays are controlling the doors. These are the door relays. This is a door controller board right here. So if you have this wire, like look at the green wires, right? Like these wires. We're going to talk about wiring very, very easily just to get you up to speed on how you might know how to come along with like a piece of wire yourself and just start hot wiring things and making doors open. Lanier makes it easier on you. You don't have to do this kind of shenanigans if you don't want. Lanier does put a momentary switch right next to each relay. So if you open a linear cabinet, you can just momentary the doors open. That's fine. It'll flip the state of the relay. And I'd like, I was going up to a gated community once, and I was going to meet somebody, and they didn't answer their phone. And I was like, hey, they're not, what the hell? They're not, they're not picking up, so linear box. <laughs> didn't even have to get out of the car, right? All right, it's probably relay one. Let's try it. Start pushing on it. Oh, yeah, there goes the gate. All right, well, we're good now. Solid. Nice job. <laughs> How much was that linear key? Like 12 bucks? <laughs> yeah, that works. Another player in this industry, Door King. Holy Christ, you can identify Door King from space. A, Z, call. A, Z, those three big buttons. A, Z, call. That is Door King all day long. Is it shocking anyone at this point that Door King all uses the same key? Door King, DKS, 16120 key. Yes, it is absolutely for sale all over the internet. It is not expensive. It is not hard to get. I had fun at like ISC West, the big security trade show. I went to the Door King booth and I was just like unlocking things all the time. Just like, yeah, all right, still using that 6120 key. That's great. Yeah, I found it for four bucks. Man, it dropped it in price. Awesome. So here's a Door King unit, right? We've got a lot going on here. We'll look inside. Woo, scary wires. Don't worry, I got you. Let's look at these wires from a second here. Let's look down. We've got a big terminal block, right, with a bunch of connections happening. Well, if I wasn't next to you and you were like, oh, what can I do with this thing? Like, you all have the internet in your pocket. Look up door king manuals online. Look up some PDFs and you'll start seeing, oh, look, there's a giant wiring diagram and there's, we, got all these, we got all these parts. There is something very, very useful that you don't have to know anything about how the install is actually wired. All you have to know is that this function exists in many door king systems. PSW, postal switch. Let's look more closely at that. What does it say? A closure between terminal 4 and terminal 6, the common ground, will affect the door relays. It'll affect an ingress and entry. It doesn't matter if the door is wired with this door relay 1, relay 2. It doesn't matter if it's normally open or closed, which we'll talk about. It just punch that, boom. That this is an add-on feature that these boxes support. Let's take a look at this terminal block again. Numbers four, postal switch. Is that hooked up? I see some wires going to it. Where do they go? We got a whole bunch of wires. There's this like little blue wire going on. Let's where the blue goes. Going here, it's going around here. The little beam connectors. Oh, what the? It's just a momentary switch. Yeah, this is a tail cam on a lock. This is to allow local municipalities to wire up their own access for postal access or gas meter reader access. These boxes often have knockouts on the front that you can just knock a plate out, put your own lock in, and every lock just, you know, you turn the tail cam and it just smacks that postal switch. This is not hard to do with your fingies. So we have a door king, can I talk about, you know, electronic credentials, you can mess with that. Override key, you could try to pick it, but why bother? <laughs> yeah, 
you get the ding of happiness if you press that little momentary switch. Door opens up, right? Like, this is pop. Key to like systems are a huge thing. And if you're not in the security locksmithing world, this sounds insane. These two keys represent the most common keys that have ever existed and still exist in America, effectively. The old national cabinet, the old C415A, the brassy colored one, is a little bit outdated now. The other one, the CH751. How many people have ever seen, like you were watching me online, I don't know if Zach, you ever seen me joking at the CH751. People literally tweet me pictures of this key when it shows up. It shows up in like the news. If you saw the stories about, oh, you know, criminals are putting skimmers inside of gas pumps with this special key, and then the news showed the key. We're like, first, that's dumb, don't do that. And two, up, down, up, down, up, uh, there's a CH751. It is America's, like, most rinky-dink, doofus, I need a lock on this stupid thing to stop arguments in the office kind of key. It is like the cheapest reused cam lock key. But if you, I mean, that's funny, but you walk into a wiring closet, this is a Brevo badge system, the entire access control system for the building. This is an enunciator fire control panel. These are both CH751s. Honeywell, badge system, fire controls, other systems, all these little cabinets that you see. CH751 works tons of them. Alarm cabinet, generator on the outside of a building, that little lock, CH751, absolutely. You get into the generator controls. Sometimes they're just labeled for you, like, this was, you know, it's right there. <laughs> Flame and storage, like high-end high storage, this is a fire cabinet, you know, with a bunch of flammables in a lab. CH751 is what unlocked it. This is my favorite ever, right? What do you think this cabinet is? This cabinet is the key box for the whole goddamn building, and it was a freaking CH751. You know my favorite part of this job in this building? This key cabinet contains no less than three more CH751s for other stuff in this building. <laughs> you can get these keys, they are not expensive. And just, again, you can't be the guy who stands there like trying 18 keys in a real emergency. But if you're standing around, you've got like three or four, I'll show you my like preferred keys later on. Uh, elevators, like elevators are all key like. If I know that you go through special training for elevators, you shouldn't mess with the elevators if you haven't had the training for affecting a rescue in an elevator, but elevators are all key alike. I have a whole talk online, my buddy Howard. Howard and I talk about elevator hacking is the name of the talk, right? Getting elevators to go places in a building outside of the security model. Getting to restricted floors in a building. Like, we use our elevator keys when we're banging around buildings like this. Houses. That wouldn't be key to like houses. That's just dumb. I should leave. Well, there are. They just don't usually look like this. You know when you'll find key to like houses? When you look like this. Properties that are foreclosed, properties that are in disrepair, properties that enter the control of HUD. HUD doesn't, you know, HUD's an administrative body, but they've got to handle these properties. They've got to get them back into shape. They've got to determine what condition they're in. Locksmiths all around the country can work under contract for HUD. There's an official spec sheet that says, you're gonna work on this house, you're gonna service this house for the time that it is currently HUD controlled, it will be keyed to these two quick set keys. Any padlock anywhere on the property is this one style of master padlock with a single key bit into it. In fact, this is another freebie for you. If you search A389er, the A389, that is, it's not always made by master. It's so in demand as a padlock now for these government jobs, you will get the key. The actual bidding is like 2682. Two, two? I don't know, I have it in my notes, but it doesn't matter what the freaking bidding is. It is 4246, all right, in the master cuts. But like literally, look on, if you, you will sometimes wind up getting these locks if you just buy a cheap enough lock, even if you weren't trying to order it. They are just flooded on the market from China at this point. And they all come with one or two of this master lock key. So if you're at a property, and especially if that property is in disrepair or possibly abandoned, and there's padlocks on gates or doors, having this key will often pop that lock right open. What about garage doors? Has anyone ever heard of the garage door tool? Show of hands, anyone know the garage door tool? A couple, some of the cops in the room might know it. Yes, so most of you know the garage door has the, the red release, right? The red, you know, disengage mechanism, your power goes out. When the door is shut, that's really near the front of the door. 
there's a long, long tool that reaches up with a hook on the end of it. It's a flat piece of metal that'll slip around the weather stripping. Oops. And you can just grab right on that, yank down on it, and roll up the garage door. Many people today, even if they lock their house, a lot of people aren't locking the inside door to the house in the garage, the, the interior passage door. It's a very reliable way of trying to get in that property if you don't want to mess with the front door. This tool is not hard to find. It's just called the garage door release. There's a number of names for it, but like, reach out to me. We can, Robert, my guy you've seen in the videos, he can get it for you. My everyday carry keys, which is this, this little guy that you saw me playing with earlier here, if I had to whittle it down to one kind of list, this is, tends to be the list that I use. We didn't talk about elevators, but this is the most common elevator key in America. And again, if you don't know, if you haven't had fire training on how fire service phase one, fire service phase two, how it works in an elevator, don't mess with elevators. You're not probably going to do anything that's going to kill anybody, but you can trap yourself if you screw up. So, you know, your buddies will laugh at you. But that is a very common elevator key. The EK333, we didn't mention it, but I do a lot of work in the tech sector. This is the most common key on uh, server room cabinets, locking cabinets uh, inside of, you know, big uh, server farms. Talked about this one, though. 222343, who does that work? Linear. That's linear, absolutely. That's a linear key. We've got the C415A. We've got the little CH751. That's like America's everything key. 16120, that was another vendor that has telephony systems out front. Who's that? Door. Who? door King. How do you recognize a Door King? AZ Call. Giant three buttons. Absolutely. Uh, these are just little jigglers that we can talk about in other situations. It's for just trying to give a quick, quick bounce at a lock. If you're not trying to pick it, you can sometimes just wiggle it open. <laughs> Fellows on the job. I'd encourage anyone who wants to covertly look at their cruiser key. If you pull out your keys right now, there's a strong possibility that's the key to your black and white roller. The 1284X is Ford Motor Company's fleet key. It's one of the fleet keys, but it's the most popular, the first key in the fleet key series. So if you have a municipality that says, all right, we need three excursions, two expeditions, and a bunch of Crown Vicks, and we need them all key to like, and the Ford rep doesn't ask which key would you like that to be, you're getting 1284X. And what's the most common usage of a Crown Vic in this country after it's had enough rating miles and you have to kick it out of the fleet? Taxi. There are taxis in America where all the taxis or half the taxis in the town are all key to like and they're key to like to the black and whites in the town. The 1284X key is a really common key and I like to carry it around just to, you know, mostly have fun with fellows on the job. I'm like, hey, you want to try this? I won't look, but you can then you hear a gasp and you're like, huh, I wonder if that worked. So yeah, the, uh, this is kind of my like devious key ring. Uh, this slide has become really popular in a lot of talks that I've uh, given. Like one guy must have freeze framed it because if you look on eBay now, there's one seller selling this whole list of keys and it looks like a smoking deal. You're like 15 bucks, no way. And then you realize that they're drop down menus. So some a-hole is selling each one of these keys for $15. Uh, do not pay that. As we just established earlier, these are like $4, $3, $12. Like, if you need keys, we can get you the keys. We will not give you the 1284X key unless you're actually on the job, though. Don't ask. There's this one other kind of dangly bit hanging off the end, by the way. What's this flopping around? I got tired of looking on the ground for, like, broken paper clips. That's just a wire loop. So when if I have to hotwire the systems, I just actually keep one on me at this point. So that's my everyday set. It folds up in a nice little compact package. Again, I don't want to give you, like, you don't need to schlep more weight around on your shoulders. I'm trying to give you small things that are easy to just tote around. We're not going to dig really deep into electronic access control systems, like enterprise access control systems. I will tell you, if you're interested, this is the kind of stuff that we do talk about for certain clients. Like, you know, credentials, badge readers. Our badge reader looks different than most badge readers. I have it with me if you have electronic credentials you want to play with later. Like, I can usually crack the encryption on most electronic credentials in a second, and I can talk about cloning credentials. That's a whole other world. I just love that, you know, the fun of it, what we do on penetration gigs. Like, this is an oversized badge reader. It's what you might see on a parking garage, you know, so you can read cards maybe a foot or two away. Well, we weaponize these. We put our own circuitry inside of them. And we run a little battery pack inside of them. So if we have a, you know, a covert entry job and we have targeting of, oh, that's a key executive, and that's a person who has a badge. 
Well, this is our buddy Dennis, and he's going to sit down, and he looks like he's on his phone, but he's not really on his phone. He's actually verifying that, okay, I got a badge reader, good. So he's got a badge reader in that backpack that just grabbed a key out of someone's pocket. And people love wearing their badges out, like out and about, out in restaurants. Again, like, this is Silicon Valley life. I grab badges from weird places, man. <laughs> so, yeah, attacking badges, attacking badge readers. If you really do want to get into this stuff, we're happy to, it's beyond the scope of this here, right? But putting a sniffer, putting a sniffer bug behind a badge reader and just intercepting traffic when people are badging in all the time. Like, that's a thing that can exist. I'm happy to talk about it on a different day if you're interested in that kind of jam. One thing, though, that I would encourage you to check, on badge readers, if you don't know this, even in weird environments, there are sometimes fire department access built right in. So you don't have to know all these crazy electronic attacks, even, oh, it's an electronic system. Well, get a little closer. Like, it's literally just key to the local Knox box, and that's not a Knox box with a key in it. That's just a momentary switch. That will just affect the gate. That'll, that'll get you out on the you know, apron of this airport. Let's look at this door. Again, this is not an electronic credentials attacking class. But I will say, you don't necessarily have to attack the electronic credentials. What might you do here? Yeah, exactly. Like, look at, the, look at how much room you've got here. You could absolutely slip that. This is an electronically controlled latch. You could add to that, that guard bolt's doing nothing. Yeah, you're, you're tracking. How about this one? What do we got here? What do you see? Knox box. Yeah, this Knox box. You know Knox boxes nowadays will sometimes have the electronic credentials for a building in them. Now, it's hard to steal a key, a mechanical key, out of a Knox box without it being open. I can absolutely put my Proxmark with a big enough antenna against a Knox box and sometimes get an electronic credential through the box. That's a thing. We don't have to do that here, though. Why not? Yeah, well, it says card needed for after hours. Well, if you look, green. Green almost always means passage mode. If you walk up and the door is green, like, don't start grabbing your tools. It could just be open, so you know, try that first. Uh, yeah, we, we talk, this is a whole separate realm of stuff we do. In our trainings, like, we, we talk about alarm systems. We talk about breaking electronic access controls. I'm not going to dig into that now, but I will give you one more nugget from these kind of classes that we run. My buddy Bobak, he's our main electronics guy. He is holding a couple of electronic badge reader keypad systems. The two specific ones that you are seeing here are both examples of an odd kind of case. The enforcer, which is like super, super cheap, you know, self-contained system. And the one by HID, HID is a big name. This HID thing though is not just a badge reader, this is called a hid entry prox. In both of these units, the whole access control logic is in the reader. It is not in a wiring closet with a door controller somewhere else. If you get this reader just off the wall, you have access to all the electronic bits you would ever need. So here we have, like, this is a hit entry box, like, right there. And this is in a proper building. It clearly has an intercom tied to something else. I don't know why they bolted on this hit entry box, but if you pop that off the wall, you absolutely could get in this door without really any fanfare. My buddy, uh, there's, and on YouTube, some of you may have heard of this guy, Lockpicking Lawyer, right? Like, Lockpicking Lawyer, very famous YouTuber who does just video after video, really short two-minute vignettes, three-minute vignettes, and he has a video talking about the Enforcer keypad, and all he uses is a paper clip and his tiny Swiss Army knife. So being able to pop that open and just short a contact, and it's, it's a really nice little lesson there. And again, I promised you I was not going to get too deep into electronics, but one note I'll give you for basic circuitry. If you look inside of any system and you see some kind of terminal connector, so you've got like NC, NO, like what's this? This is what I want you to understand. That's all he looked for when he flipped this over. He knew what to bridge and how to do it. And I'm going to walk you through it real quick. NC stands for normally closed. And O stands for normally open. C is common, it's common ground. So let's think about wiring. If you saw two wires, you had the common and you had something wired NC. NC is what? Normally closed. This is what the logic is inside of that circuitry. Normally closed, except when you make an entry, like a valid entry, you know, it opens and then it shuts again. 
This would be, so that's something that's on power. Typically, that's going to be a magnetic lock, right? The magnetic lock needs power, and then if momentarily it's open, but then it's normally closed, okay? The flip side of that would be a normally open circuit, right? So like a solenoid-based electronic strike. Normally, the circuit is open. It is not on power. If you buzz in or you use your pin code or something, it closes, gives power, and then it opens up again. If you understand those basics, normally open, normally closed, and these are not usually live mains voltage, this is just lower, this is circuitry, dry pair, contacts. You can look inside of other systems and you don't need to be that worried about them. So let's say the door king didn't have the postal switch. There are clearly like these gigantic, you know, in the manual, like relay, relay one, relay two, right? Well, is one of the relays hooked up? Yeah. We can see it's slightly different. One common, one normally closed, one normally open, because we have two relays over here, right? So it is hooked up. And how is it hooked up? Is one common is wired to normally open and normally closed? Normally, I know it's blurry, but that's NO. So this is normally open. So if it's normally open when it's locked and someone accesses it with a card or a pen and it, it would close temporarily, what do you have to do to get the hell in? Yeah, it's jumping. If it's normally open, you close it. If it's normally closed, you open it. Many times opening can be yanked the wire, or it can, many times they're little terminal blocks. You can just kind of pull them off for a second. That'll work. So yeah, you, you know that little wire loop that I had on my keychain? This is why. This system didn't have, you can see there's no knockout, there's no extra lock on the front, there's no postal switch, but I can still hotwire it because I can find the door relay. It's a door king, got those big buttons. 6120 key gets me open, pull out the wire loop, reach in, look for the ones that are needed, and touch. You can do this. Like, I, even if you're not a wires person, you're not an electronical person, that's okay. You, this is within the realm of possibility for you. Couple of quick ones left, and I know you're starting to fade. It's been a long night. Are you still happy to be here? Yeah. All right, all right, that's what I like to hear. And all right, I'm, I promise I'm not gonna run away on you. Someone's like, don't go, it's all good. So electronic locks, people love adding pin codes to stuff, right? People love to just add, like I need a pin code on my door. Um, look at this, we talked about this with the, the mechanical key box, right? If we look at this pin code reader, I'm like, boy, I think that pin code was set once and never changed. What numbers might be part of the pin code? <laughs> One and nine, and then pound to like enter it. Do you know that a lot of these systems, 911 is many times programmed in for first responders? Try it. 911 or 911 pound, many times that will affect an entry. And you, I, you can even see the one is worn away about twice as much as the nine. I bet you anything 911 is involved. I bet you 911 is not involved on here, but what can we see? Yeah, we got twos and threes and pounds because the rest of the buttons are goddamn filthy. What do you think the code could be here? Somebody said 789 because they look nice and clean. I personally would say that 1, 2, and 3 look worn away, maybe the 4. I think it's 1, 2, 3, 4 if I had to really guess. Here's another one. Like you can, again, you can see this is a trilogy. Trilogy T3 is this lock if you ever run into it. Popular in like restaurant bathrooms. Yeah, one, two, maybe nine. I'd say some variant of that. Here we got another one, ones and fours. Maybe four, four, one, four, one, one. I think if I remember this job, this was actually like four, one, one Main Street. It like was the name, it was the building number. I was like, oh, check it out, guys. I bet that's it. And sure enough, it was. Residential lock, same thing. Somebody please wash your hands. That's how the coronavirus spreads. <laughs> like this one's just been worn away so much that it's just destroyed. Like... I don't know what is going on here, but that's never been changed. Same thing here, like, oh my god, 1970, good year, I guess. You don't have to do a lot of guesswork on this one. We got a nice little label that someone put there. I, like, this happens more than you think. Like, why are you making, if, why is the lock here? Somebody was tired of like giving the bathroom code or whatever this was, and they just put a sticker on. The one that really baffles me is like, the, what? Money was spent. Like, someone went to a store and was like, I need an engraved plaque. No, no one's retiring. I just don't want to give out the pin code anymore. Like, what on earth? 
Kaba, the Kaba simplex five button, clearly one, clearly three, clearly five. Uh, by the way, there's a note about that. Kaba simplex, which is a, this is a very popular, very specific lock that you see in environments. I love this video. This I'm going to let my buddy talk here. Wonder what it could be. I don't know. Endless possibilities. Oh wow, that worked. Amazing. Now that's funny, right? Until you start seeing. A lot of times, push two, then two and four, then three, that is the default code out of the box on any Kava simplex. Two and four at the same time, then three, then turn the handle. <laughs> Try it. Try it. This is Robert walking around the federal courthouses in Virginia, right? Like, federal building, federal building here, and he knows the owner. He said, hey, I'm going to walk Envy around the block, so he's got his s &R dog, and he's like, all right. Kava simplex, two, four, three. That's not a new install. That's been there for years. Couple of final notes. We're winding it up. I'm not going to keep you too much longer, I swear. Uh, getting around fences. I understand you've got ladders. You've got a lot of ladders. But who wants to drag a ladder around all the time? Uh, chain fences, you know, there's standard chain. But we, we do a whole class about perimeter defense. So we have these slides about anti climb fences, palisade fences what the government official standard of fence is. If you ever have to put a fence in, you can just say, I follow the standard, and hopefully no one would say it's deficient. The point is, you can trench under fences. We've done it on jobs. We've done this trying to penetrate various facilities. If you want to go over the fence, though, fence climbers, little, little fence climbers made by Zach Tool, uh, somebody else makes a similar version, and the idea is you slip them right through the fence, and they fall down, they make little, they make little steps. So you can scale a fence. The other ends of them work like wire cutters, so you can chop the fence if you have to. Uh, and again, they, they fit in a pocket, they fit in a cargo pocket. It's one extra tool, maybe you want it, maybe you have it around. Now, to wrap it up, who was paying attention? I'm gonna quiz you on a few things, all right? What do you see? Shout it out. Padlock. See a padlock? What else do you see? Yeah, we've got a padlock down here. We've got a combo box up here. It turns out that not only was the combo, but like again, you could scale this fence, but not only was the padlock key in that box, but the house key was in the box too. So we were able to get in really easily this property. Have we seen this lock earlier? What kind was it? Warded lock. Is there, is there an attack for this? Most absolutely, we can play with it later. What do you see? Master, where's the master? Oh yeah, we see duct tape and stuff up here. Yeah, it's, it's holding it shut, I guess. But yeah, we've got the little Master 175 down here. Absolutely bypassable. We can all play with that in a minute. What do you see? Which Hit Prox product is this? It is HID. It is the, brand, the, the model they call the Entry Prox. Why is that one special? Yeah, all the logic is in this unit. If you pop that plastic right off the wall, you absolutely can bang this door open. It is the HID entry prox. It looks like no other HID prox product. It looks very unique and weird. How about this lock? Absolutely, it's a padlock. What's the tool that we like to use on this? Comb, overlifting with a comb. Good job. Anyone remember the brand? Kaba, Kaba Simplex. What's the default code? Yeah, it's not two, four, three. It's two and four at the same time, then three. Pop it open. This was at SHOT Show and Media Day. This was like a, like a $500 pistol that was on display, and they had the backup copy at the range. And like, sure enough, just, you know, Master 175. How can we get into this? What's that called? Yeah, you wouldn't really shim it. It's actually, it's called kind of just a rocking or a spring open. It's really just a bypass attack. What brand? Door King, absolutely, AZ call. Will the 16120 key open it? Yes, it will. Will it help you? No, it won't. This is a weird aftermarket mod that I've never seen. I don't know what was happening at this property that someone just drilled a bar, like, through it. So, like, I mean, I would have just swapped out the cam lock, but all right, good on you guys. What do you see? Yes, Kaba Simplex, one more time. What's the default? Two, four, three. And we also have what looks like 
Is that an Xbox? I can't quite see from here. No, that is just a button. But, what are we talking about with elevators? Elevators key to like, absolutely. That's going to be the fire service phase one key, the emergency recall key. That's going to be key to like across that whole brand. And if I had to guess, that could be Otis. That looks like an Otis Vandal Resistant or Otis Survivor line fixtures. That would be UTF key if you're curious on Otis. Loads of rapid entry boxes. One is probably the official city's box right here. Then we have a couple of Supras. Who put this one on the wall? Comcast, absolutely. Another one, some other. This is just like a kitty, you know, this is a, not a kitty access point. Who is this? This is another one made by Supra, but again, it's just a push button lock. So you've got the best product on the market, marginal products, terrible products, all four with the same goddamn key inside of it. I know which one I would attack. Got a push button lock. We could try to see if maybe any of these buttons were worn away or something like that. Personally, I don't think you'd have to do that. Why? Yeah, you could reach in the mail slot and you could look painted with a thousand layers of paint. It is a master of five, uh, 5400 series. It's just kind of hidden. It's like camouflage paint in there. But yeah, that's what I would personally do. Couple of things, hard to see. Let's zoom in. Name some stuff. We've got, this is actually, if you see, AZ called. This is a slimline door cane. Somebody said this over here. We got another hit entry prox. This is a little key guard. That's the brand. Key guard is a push button access box. And we even do have a municipality. This is a postal key. That's another way that criminals are breaking in sometimes to lobbies. A couple more photos from the field. What do you see? How would you get into this house? You can climb over the wall, absolutely. You can even drag this, uh, this hose thing over. You can stand on the gas line, maybe. Hopefully, you don't break it. There's one other thing in this photo. It's hard to see. Ah, yes! Oh, the, the rock. You said, is there a hide a key in the rocks? No, it's not in the rocks. But if we look way over here, look who's hiding there. Absolutely. Another 5400. These guys are everywhere. Master has this market on, like, lock. We got a chained up uh, yard out here. Let's get a little closer. Which one is it? It's not the 175. It's what they replaced it with. The 875. How did I know that? The ridges, absolutely. Ridged for your decoding needs. Whose product? Door King. What's the number of the Door King key? Somebody wrote it down. I hear you. 16120. It is on eBay right now. I swear to you. You will find it. Have we got another Knox box? And they're also using a little a tiny hit prox. Looks like it's rebranded by Bosch, possibly. But we could clone that credential, we could do, there's a whole, like, electronic, I am, I am not the electronics guy that Bobak is, but I really enjoy crazy RF credentials stuff, uh, to the point that my wife and I both have, like, embedded credentials, we have injectables in our hands, so that I can copy hotel keys and stuff to my hands, there's, there's video online if you want to see me getting a giant needle and then opening doors with my hands. Knox boxes, by the way, they're not just in commercial environments now, I've been blown away by the fact that you can actually find them in residential spaces. And this was not a Knox box that was like in front of every unit in this townhome. So I'm wondering if this whole complex was keyed, like master keyed, and the residents didn't even know. I don't know. It's not Door King, it's who? Linear. What's the linear key? 22343. Absolutely, absolutely. Not the A126, although you'll find it marketed like that. So we could go on and on and on. We can talk about situations where there are so many different locks and gates and systems, where we have a really old door king. This one doesn't have the three buttons, it's so old, but it is the door king badge. That's still a 16120. We've got a key box here. We actually have Knox making a padlock to a, you know, behind this padlock, if you have the Knox key, it doesn't always have to be a Knox box. Knox can make padlocks. There's emergency releases there. And you can even see the door they try to prevent you from reaching through. There's plexiglass all over this door, but because of wind, they cut all these holes in it. So we could just reach through, kind of reach a little like, string from our other door tool. We're able to yank the handle, get that open. So these sort of situations are the ones that I want you to start noticing all kind of strange stuff. There's all these different card technologies, and they're all piping in through one box here. Yes, there's a Knox box on the wall, but there's shitball boxes all along here. Uh, there's, there's always a way in. There's always something you can do. And one way or another, I like to imagine that you know, you can, you're not going to let things stand in your way. 
like this guy right here. Excellent, excellent. Now, as I let you go, I want to mention that this kind of knowledge, like, when you're working, you're working. Like, there's a reason to get in. Like, you know, you need to get in for a reason. We always teach, whenever we teach lock picking and door entry, be mindful of how other people are going to think of your actions. Be mindful of, like, if you don't own that lock, if you don't really, if you're not under your job, if you're not going in because of, like, work, this is exciting stuff. I get it. You can be like, I got these new tools. I learned about it. This is badass. But then you can be this person emailing me, like, oh, no, I broke a pick inside of my house, and now I can't lock my own home. Like, sometimes buying a couple practice locks and playing, like, desktop style first, I recommend. The state laws, I'm not a lawyer, but I will tell you this kind of stuff is broadly, broadly legal. All this kind of entry, possession of these tools is generally not illegal almost anywhere. What is illegal is using them improperly. Um, this is kind of a sad story, the way this turned out. This was a situation where there was a domestic disturbance call, and officers responded, and this is a much longer video taken from somebody's Axon camera, right? And they were having like an argument with the homeowner, the homeowner was like, no, 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 I'm asleep, go away, and went back in the house. And the officers kind of like talk for a while, talk with each other, talk for a while, talk with each other. And one guy said, I've got pics in my, in my cruiser, went out and got them. And they tried to later say, they said, well, we, we had to, they picked their way in, or they were trying to, actually, it didn't work. They, they picked for like 15 minutes, and then they still couldn't get in, so one of them kicked the glass out. And during the write-up, they were like, what was happening? He said, well, it was exigent circumstances. It was, it was exigency. We had to, because there was a domestic disturbance. And they said, look, it was exigent circumstances when you rolled up to the property. You can't have a 15-minute conversation. And everyone wants to try this stuff. But if you're, do, if you're on an entry, and you're like, I really don't want to break the door. I don't want to break the door. And you know, you're slipping, you're trying, you're slipping. If you take too long, you wind up then, well, what was really going through your mind? Can you justify it? Can you not? And this, this department had like a lot of problems. This was kind of thankfully a weird edge case that had like a lot of challenges in this. Well, I don't want to dwell on negative stuff. I want to end on a really positive note. I want to end by thanking everyone who comes to these kind of events and who watches the videos and who tries this stuff where I've had paramedics, like I had a paramedic write to me. And he was like, you know, look, we had this call out. You know, it was really awesome. Uh, we, this woman called, shortness of breath. By the time we got there, and how many people, like, you run into this, right? You get there, you can't get the person on the phone anymore. Um, nobody knows, like, their neighbors. It's, people live alone nowadays more and more. Or you've been dispatched because of an electronic monitoring call out, and you've got no secondary signs. So they're, like, looking at each other, like, I don't know what we can do. Should we, should we call the fire department? Should we call the police? I, I'm not going to break this door down. But he looked. He was like, oh, door king. Door king. I spot it. 16120 key. Bam. Opens up. Finds her on the floor. Dysrhythmia, snaps her out of it. She's fine, she's laughing with him about the whole story about her door king box as he took her in the ambulance. And nobody died that day. And nobody's doors were broken that day. Like, I like these kind of stories. Uh, my team and I regularly uh, lecture the mids out of Annapolis. We go up to West Point, we talk to the cadets. And we get, you know, messages sometimes where someone's like, in our line of work, much like your line of work, you've got options if you want to go kinetic. Like, C4 are going to get the job done if you're an EOD tech. Halligan Bar is going to get the job done if you need to get in. But when people can say, like, being able to get in silently, effortlessly, that's the kind of stuff in your line of work that can save lives. That's the kind of stuff in their line of work that can save lives. And it's really rewarding for me when people say this, when they say, I learned something that I didn't think I could do, and I was able to get in, and that made a difference. So thank you so much for uh, inviting me to cool places. Thank you for listening tonight. This is really, really rewarding. And if you ever want to learn more, again, like I'm not up here selling you anything, but I'm hopefully trying to convince you that you, you can do this. You don't have to go destructive. I put all my lectures online, all my talks, all my slides. Uh, yes, as Zach you know, knows, and he wants to come on down. Like We have a whole classroom in Virginia. If you want to go hands-on with a bunch of stuff, we're happy to train you up on it. We're happy to, if you don't like those electronics, like, come do the electronics class. You don't have to be a wizard at this. We can give you options. And I love giving you the options I gave you tonight. If someone like Robert, like, Robert's an ex-cop. He's a sniper. He is not a wires guy. But if he can do this kind of stuff, if my dumbass can do this kind of stuff, uh, anyone in this room can do this kind of stuff. So I really hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed this. And, uh, yeah, thanks for being here.